Hi everybody, it's eight o'clock and uh, Eastern time. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about these police shootings in recent days. It's hard not to think about them. And I decided that I really wanted to talk to somebody who could help us understand more about what, what's been going on and how we reform police departments, especially when I heard that 30 states have passed something like 140 laws regarding police reform. So I thought I would share with you a conversation I'm about to have with Dr. Philip Atiba Goff. He is a professor of African-American studies and psychology at Yale, and he's the co-founder and CEO of something called the Center for Police Equity. I thought, hi everyone, I thought we could learn a lot from him in terms of what we might be able to do and how we can help police officers do a better job. And, you know, I'm curious these um, acts and, and what police procedure is, what is the problem? Or are we not getting enough uh, people who want to be police officers? And so, um, sorry, everybody, I'm just looking for him. Um, here he is. So I thought we'd have a conversation about this, and I'm really glad that people are interested in this and and want to join us. Hey, Dr. Goff, thanks so much for doing this with me tonight. No, thanks for having me, Katie. You know, I've watched your TED Talk, and I was just saying to people who are joining us that it's very frustrating that these incidents continue to happen. And I don't know about you, but I'm always trying to figure out solutions, if possible, to some of these problems. And um, clearly we've got a problem in policing today in America, that's not a news flash. And as I was mentioning, 30 states have passed something like 140 different laws dealing with police reform, but clearly they're not working. So thank you for having this conversation. Can you tell everyone a little bit about what the Center for Police uh, Equity, Policing Equity is? Sure. Um, so I have uh, two, two jobs, roughly. I'm a professor at Yale, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity. The Center for Policing Equity um, is a research and action organization whose job is, whose mission is to help um, communities and law enforcement make policing less racist, less deadly, and oftentimes just less to reduce the footprint of law enforcement in the communities that are most vulnerable. And we do that by engaging uh, communities and law enforcement in the social science and use data to make it easier for folks to come together on, on shared solutions. So, I mean, it, I, I'd like to go back to my observation that all these states have passed laws. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not a panacea, Dr. Goff. There's not a single solution for all problems. But can you tell us what you see? You've been studying this issue and know it very, very well. What are some of the problems that are creating an environment where this happens over and over again? Yeah, so I know that over the summer there was a, a slogan that got people pretty concerned, the defund the police slogan, okay? Um, I wanna put that in a little bit of context for folks though. Yeah. Um, in most of the communities where um, policing is, is a, a problem, where they're concerned about it, they've already defunded schools, they defunded mental health, they defunded uh, substance use and, and homelessness uh, resources. The only public good that gets any kind of money is the police. And so what I'm hearing activists talk about now um, is sort of re-messaging is refunding. Because right. what's happening is that you're saying what, what leads to these sets of, of issues. For sure, we have training issues. For sure, we're not hiring always the best officers. But also, why is it that if someone buys a pack of cigarettes, and then resells them individually. I need five people to put their arms around somebody's neck and take them to the ground. Yeah. Why is it when someone's got ex expired tags, right? That I'm gonna pull them over and then pull even a taser out. We don't need police responding to these sets of things. And police agree for the last 20 years, they've been saying, get us out of there. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting because in preparing for this interview, I didn't realize that so many rank and file police officers actually agree with many of the protesters who are taking part in Black Lives Matter protests that they believe 
changes need to be happening. And when we, I think that's such an important point about defunding the police. I always thought they had a real branding problem with that word. And I, I, whoever thought of that, I think probably regrets it because I think it does strike fear in people like, wait, you want to get rid of all police departments, but it really is, you're really talking about reallocating funds in a community so that it goes to mental health issues and and that they have different kinds of professionals who are responding to, to, to these problems. But let me ask you, Dr. Goff, what if one of the issues that you think only needs a mental health professional, God forbid, what if it does escalate into a really dangerous situation and you put someone who hasn't been properly trained to deal with that? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll put back to you, what happens in a school that doesn't have law enforcement there if somebody shows up? What happens in a mental health hospital um, if somebody turns violent? What happens to a community when someone they're trying to get into a housing facility ends up having a mental health break or a substance abuse break? The same thing. They can retreat and they can call for someone whose job it is to de-escalate violence. Now, we may call that police. By the way, we may not. In, in New York, there's an uh, organization called Life Camp. And what they do is they get to know the places where violence is most likely to happen. They forge relationships. And when they think that something might happen, they're able to get there first. And when something violent has happened, they're able to start to intervene. All what, we're, what, we mean, what we mean in the space where we're talking about reducing the footprint of law enforcement is often not that there's nobody who can, who can respond. It's just to look at the actual data and say, way too often we're sending a badge and a gun into spaces where that's just escalating things right and are some communities doing that in fact are some communities kind of taking a look at police are needed and reallocating funding and what is the impact of that that change been can you tell us about that yeah, there's lots of places that are doing that. So in Denver, Colorado, for instance, um, uh, they have removed law enforcement from schools and they stopped sending law enforcement um, to places where someone's in mental health crisis. So what happened was a month into that little experiment, the police chief said, we are saving lives. We should always have been doing this. Law enforcement should never be in this business. The chief said that. In Ithaca, New York, I think it's the, it's the most dramatic example that I know of, um, they, actually, they called up the Center for Policing Equity. They called a bunch of outside experts out. And they said, we want to start from scratch. How would we start to keep ourselves safe if we just, if we just started from, from ground zero? And they decided they didn't want a police department. They wanted a department of community solutions and public safety. Now, some law enforcement will be there, but it's going to be majority unarmed, civilian-led, and they're never going to send a badge and a gun to a nonviolent call which by the way is 96% of what law enforcement's responding to in most cities. And that it just makes sense if you're starting from scratch, but we're not starting from scratch. So it can be even scarier to think about, well, if you get rid of police, how do we stay safe? When you give yourself the space to imagine it, which is why we're talking about reimagining, you come up with something really different. And in fact, you wrote a piece uh, for Time Magazine, I think a couple of days ago, and you said police are doing too much. Chiefs will tell you, that maybe 20% of their department's time has been on investigating crimes and arresting suspects, what most people consider uh, core police functions. The rest is spent responding to incidents that stem from issues like homelessness, substance abuse, mental health, or even mundane between neighbors. That's right. 80% of what most law enforcement are doing, it's not fighting crime. It's doing the things the neighborhood needs. How, how much has this problem been exacerbated by the militarization of police forces across the country? And can you explain that to people who are listening to our conversation? Yeah, sure. So there has been a, 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 a statute that allows for local law enforcement to apply to get decommissioned military equipment. That means things that look a whole heck of a lot like tanks in our nation's cities. I don't know why we need tanks in cities. In fact, I thought the reason we had a military so we would never see tanks in cities. And yet that's what law enforcement sometimes ends up with. What I'll say about that is that I, I feel differently than many other folks do um, that, that are interested in changing law enforcement. Um, I do feel like you dress for the job you want. So if you dress law enforcement in military attire, they're gonna show up to war, but it is not nearly as big a deal as asking them to do less. 
and asking them to do the things that they can be properly trained for, as opposed to asking them to show up and be EMTs and mental health responders and social workers and child welfare experts, which we do all over the country all the time. Let's talk about this latest incident that came just on the heels of the George, of the Derek Chauvin verdict with this young 16 year old girl in Columbus, Ohio. And actually someone uh, asked a question about this. I've tried to read about it. I know mm -hmm. that in the New York Times, a professor from the University of South Carolina was quoted as saying that according to the body cam footage that he viewed that the shooting was justified. And, you know, one question that all my friends and I always ask is, why do police officers shoot to kill? Why are they trying to shoot to kill? Yes, I mean, let's just say that they, that, that they are responding to a situation and they are an armed police officer. Um, why, why wouldn't they shoot someone in the leg? I don't know, I don't understand that. It just, it just seems strange. And can you explain why those policies exist? They're, I, they're trained to shoot to kill, are they not? They're trained to shoot to center, what's called center body mass, which is in the, in the chest region. And they're also trained to shoot until the suspect is neutralized, which usually means at least that they're on the ground. Um, so I can explain the logic behind it. I wanna be clear that's different than trying to justify it. Um, so the logic behind it is, and you can take the, the case of, of Makia Bryant um, uh, specifically. So she's there and there are several other people in very close proximity. Um, as good a, a, sh a shot as someone might be, as accurate as they might be, if you miss, you're endangering somebody else. And she was right next to somebody, um, right on, almost on top of somebody. So if I'm shooting you in the arm, it's a, a higher likelihood I'm just going to miss. And that means maybe I hit somebody else in the neighborhood, right? Um, <clears throat> so there's that. But there's also, if they're enough of, a, enough of a threat that I can use deadly force, I feel like that's justified. I want to make sure that I have neutralized the threat and they're not getting back up with their weapon or coming back towards me. And law enforcement get trained on all of these terrible incidents where someone did get shot in the leg, they got shot in the arm, they went down and they came back up with the gun and that officer then died. So it is not uncommon to train to shoot for center body mass. I wanna say, so I'm assuming it was Jeff Alpert if it was from someone from South Carolina because there's not a lot of us uh, that do this kind of work. Um, and, so, and, and so what he's doing, he's analyzing whether or not there was a clear and present danger to somebody else's life and whether an officer was therefore justified by statute to use deadly force. Okay, that's one conversation we can and maybe should be having, but there's another one. This girl was, a, uh, was in foster care. She has a, a history which is not an easy history. How many times did we fail her before Tuesday? How many different ways could we set up our society to provide the resources so that she or whoever called 911 didn't have to call, that she didn't have to feel so scared, she'd have to pick up a weapon to feel like she was defending herself, or if she was in the midst of a mental health crisis, that we gave her those resources. We, we, I hear all the time people say, well, we, we don't know what happened right before the camera. So the body camera is inconclusive, even when it's the worst thing on, on imaginable. But we do know a good deal about what happened in this girl's life. And if we're not trying to actively imagine systems that can prevent her from being there in the first place, even if we wanna say the officer was justified, we don't really care about it that much. We just care about determining whether or not she deserved to die. And, and we gotta do better than that. You know, it's interesting. Someone asked in the question, I took comments off because sometimes they're just really distracting, but someone asked about would the officer, let's say this had resulted in a deadly incident for the person she was threatening, or we don't know all the details. So mm -hmm. I'm just painting the scenario that seems to be the one that happened from the trip. So I just want to state that I, I wasn't there. And I don't know what happened, Dr. Goff. Would that police officer been liable if something terrible had happened to the other person who was being threatened with a knife at the time? Yeah, so in this case, from watching the film, and again, we're, we're now right at the, we're, we're talking about the specific incident. So from what I've seen of the body camera, fo camera footage from my conversations with law enforcement, um, no, and also that would have been against training. You have an officer who's sitting there who, who, who he gets out of the car and he's less than 15 seconds and he's, he's unholstered his weapon and has decided to end someone's life. If he'd been a little bit slower, um, if he'd missed, 
um, and someone was someone had died. If, if Makia had used a knife and killed someone, the officer is not going to face legal jeopardy from that. That's not going to be what happened. But also, if that body camera footage and the the, the narrative that we receive from um, uh, the city is accurate, they're trained to prevent someone from killing someone. And again, can we not imagine a world where we don't fail this girl so that that's where she ends up? I understand someone who is trying to do harm to someone is not the most sympathetic person in the world, but no one is particularly sympathetic after you've spent most of their life neglecting them. I, honestly, it's just, a, it's just about having a kinder orientation to the way that we're doing all of our public policy. And in, in, in terms of other, other uh, policy reforms, you know, what else can be done? I know implicit bias training takes place. Jennifer Eberholt, I know from Stanford, I've interviewed her about this, and she worked with the Oakland Police Department because there have been studies that show if a police officer, or really if anybody in this implicit bias test, sees someone who appears to be a Black person holding a cell phone, you know, I'm sure you know all about Dr. Goff, because this is your area of expertise, but that, that people they're more likely to shoot than if they see a silhouette of a white individual holding a phone. They've done training like that, I know, in a lot of police departments, community policing. Um, I did a story about that in a community in California where police officers live among the community and, and forge relationships and trust with individuals. But these things don't really seem to be mitigating these incidents. And I'm, I'm just curious, like, so, so yes, other than reappropriating money and focusing on some of the issues, the social services you talked about, what else can be done? Are there other solutions? Yeah, and so I, you're quite right. I'm very familiar with the studies. Jennifer and I did them together. Oh, uh, she she was my she was one of my graduate advisors. Oh, um, great. I'm, I'm I'm a big fan of both her and that research that she had me doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But both of us said, um, I, I remember I, I sent her a note in 1999 um, when we got started doing this stuff back long, long ago, um, <clears throat> uh, saying, you know, some idiot is going to come along and think that all, you're, all, all we need to do, all we need to do is train people and then it's over as if explicit bias and structural racism don't exist. And I remember she, she kind of laughed when we had the meeting about it and be like, no, that never, and yet. So we can do trainings and there is some, some positive effect. Right, um, we can uh, diversify the hiring. I didn't used to think that was a thing. Jonathan Mumlo, um, Bokar Ba, um, and Dean Knox just recently came out with an article that changed my mind. If you diversify um, law enforcement, there, there can be really strong gains. But what we're talking about there is then bending the curve. We're talking about reducing the harm. And honestly, we have a nation that's addicted to punishment. There is no reason why we have to lock somebody up for buying a carton of cigarettes and then reselling them individually. That is, but that it, that is the least cost efficient way we could possibly have to respond to that. And yet, time after time after time, we saw earlier this, uh, this month, a five-year-old in handcuffs? How, what kind of sense is that? What could a five-year-old have possibly done that putting them in handcuffs is a good idea? Those are the things where everyone who I speak to in law enforcement who does the job says it's the worst day on the job. So we should just stop asking them to do it. And at the same time, there are things like federal legislation, the Justice and Policing Act. There are good things there, right? It's everything and. But if you want to have the biggest change on these worst outcomes, stop sending badges and guns to places where they cannot do anything else other than escalate. What about recruit? Because it seems to me that the caliber of person, and, and I do believe, you know, it, that, that there are many fine people who are officers. And I think sometimes this gets forgotten in these conversations, mm -hmm. which I think is really damaging for a, a civil and productive conversation. But it seems to me that it must be difficult. I mean, are, are they being careful enough about the way they recruit people? Because, um, you know, listen, I don't know if you ever, I'm sure you know about, I remember in school, I learned about Graves' level of, ex of existence, I think. And level four, I remember, is authority, authority figure. You know, level eight is self-actualization. I'm probably screwing this up because I haven't been in high school, <laughs> Dr. Goff. But it's <laughs> that, that we have to be really careful about the kind of individuals they're 
their backgrounds and their ability that are become officers. Am I crazy about that? No, I mean, I, 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 your, your mental health is, is not showing up one way or the other on this. Um, I, I don't have to worry about that. Um, no, 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 no. But, you know, am I, am no, I guided? No. So, and, and so I think that if the goal is to make the folks who show up to do the job of law enforcement better, that we would be foolish to ignore who we're bringing into the job in the same way that we're foolish to ignore how we train them. Um, like I said, Jonathan Mumlow, Bokar Ba, they just came out with a piece in science, um, which was really convincing to me that the quality and the, the diversity of the folks who are coming on board can really make a difference. Absolutely. Um, also think about who, what, what, the, what the, the set of, of things we're asking them to do are. What level of education do you feel like folks would need to have um, in order to say, you're trained to be an EMT, you're trained to do um, mental health response, substance abuse, child welfare, homelessness, right? <clears throat> And by the way, you gotta be able to use a gun and inside of 15 seconds, make a decision about whether or not somebody should lose their life. I don't know what kind of Rhodes Scholar and Nobel Prize winner you need to be to have all those jobs and to be excellent at it, but I'd rather just disaggregate them. Send an EMT when an EMT is needed. Send, if we gotta you know, deal in violence, send violence when violence is needed and not any other time. So yes, everything and hire better people for sure. But if you want the biggest return on investment, Stop sending them to places they don't want to be. Should police officers be paid more? Should they, um, you know, I, I, I think you can reappropriate money, but you can also attract a higher caliber of individuals if they're compensated more generously. Have people in your area of expertise discussed the, that as a solution? Yeah, so policing is not just a, a United States problem. And public safety is not just a United States thing. Um, so there are folks who, who study this internationally, and it is no surprise in places with the largest corruption, they pay law enforcement the least. And so law enforcement is incentivized to go elsewhere for compensation. Mm -hmm. And there's huge range in the United States. So some places folks are, are, are earning decent blue collar wages. Other places, they're earning enough to own a nice house and retire excellent. Um, and I think that, that there's, there's argument to be made one way or the other um, on, yeah, we need to compensate them so that we're getting the quality product we want. And also, in this moment, given the last couple of weeks, given the past year, there are a lot of communities that say the idea of paying more for this, which is what we get, is obscene. So it's politically really difficult to, to move in that direction, um, especially when, you know, you said the, the latest one and you were talking about Makia Bryant, but I thought maybe you were talking about Andrew Brown, who was just killed in Elizabeth City. Um, while, while driving away, they shot in the back of his vehicle, incredibly dangerous uh, move that could have hurt other people. He was unarmed. He was not providing, approving a threat to anybody. That was just today. And because tomorrow there will probably be one to three more, because on average, police kill three people a day in the United States, it is a hard time to say more money should go to it. I, I get the, the impulse, right? But maybe we should start investing in the places we've been entirely neglected, before we start thinking about giving more money to any of the, uh, of, the, of the things that are causing us to have the conversation right now. I guess I was thinking if, they, if they're responsible for all those roles that you said, not disaggregated, you know, if they're to attract a different, uh, you know, a better perhaps person in those areas uh, to police force. Yeah, I mean, and uh, you have met most of the interesting people on the planet, or many of the most interesting people on the planet. You tell me how many of them could do all of those jobs excellently. The brilliant people that you've met. I have met like two, maybe, who I think could, ma could manage that after five to six years instead of four to five months of training, right? So we're, we're asking things that are not humanly reasonable of law enforcement. We should stop doing that. Can you just tell people who are, who are listening to this conversation a little bit about the federal legislation and if you support a you know, blanket legislation or if you believe that individual departments and individual mu municipalities should reimagine their police departments or if it's okay to have a standard of, of policing that applies nationwide? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, we need national leadership on this because it, it is definitely a national problem. It's not, this is not just a problem happening in Cleveland, right? We're seeing it all over the country. And by the way, it's Brooklyn Center more than it is Minneapolis, right? It's Ferguson more than St. Louis. It's Elizabeth City 
more than it is, you know, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so it's happening in places that don't have a huge population. You're twice as likely to get shot and killed by police in a rural or ex-urban place than you are in an urban place, just statistically mm -hmm. speaking. Um, but we need national leadership. And part of the national leadership needs to be supporting local folks. Because we got 18,000 police departments across the United States. 75% of them are 25 officers or fewer. And 1,000 are just one dude. It's, by the way, always a dude. Um, so that's not gonna get fixed at the federal level because the federal government doesn't have a lever to make them do. Like Chuck, the sheriff right out, who's, who's a one person sheriff, that Chuck is not, doesn't have to listen to the federal government. You need for communities to have the resources to take control and the federal government can supply those resources to, in, to incentivize exactly that kind of reimagining. You know, I've just in close. This has been so interesting and so important. So thank you for, for doing this, but you know, the, the, I, a lot of people were really quite nervous, terrified, in mm -hmm. fact, before the uh, verdict in the Derek Chauvin case. And I know how, 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 what an exceptional situation that was, because that doesn't happen very often at all. For a, I mean, actually, we explain why it is so hard to get a conviction that there is an incident like this. I mean, clearly there was irrefutable evidence the video that 17 year old girl took. But as I said, to, I interviewed Hillary Clinton this morning, and, and we were talking about it. And I said, there was pretty irrefutable evidence in Rodney King's uh, beating as well. So uh, can you talk about why it is so difficult to, to get a against a police officer? Yeah, so think about all the things that happened in this case. Um, if, you, if you go back to the original um, report that the officers wrote up, they said that the uh, suspect resisted and that, that the suspect died of um, chemical uh, involvement. Well, that's not remotely what actually happened. They left, they left out the nearly 10 minutes that somebody uh, knelt on his airway. But if there wasn't a video, we're almost certainly not having this conversation. Um, when someone dies in police custody, especially if there's not a firearm discharge and there's no video, it's incredibly difficult because the person who would like to say something different is usually the only person who could and they cannot anymore because they're dead. And then you add to that the length of time. Now, let's say that it had taken only three minutes. Um, three minutes? And I, I don't know that we're having this conversation, right? If he'd gotten off right at the moment where he hadn't recognized the pulse, George Floyd might have still been dead, but we wouldn't be talking about a conviction. And then almost every darn body who is a, a Minneapolis police officer came out and said, yep, this is not how we train. It's against the policy. It is absolutely unreasonable. When was the last time you saw that many folks in the same department come out, much less the chief? of the department who came out and said, nope, this is ridiculous. And then you have a medical examiner who's done all the extra tests to say, nope, that's not true. That's not possible. No way. And still, every one of us is on tender hooks because we know the truth is not always tethered to the outcome in these cases. That's part of why folks were, that fo folks were so nervous. Part of that reason, we've decided oftentimes that that's law enforcement's job. And we don't want to hold them accountable when their job is uncomfortable with our values. Should police investigating police misconduct? This is sort of an age old question with the Office of Internal Affairs and the thin blue line. Should municipalities have a separate body that investigates these incidents? Yeah, so let's imagine that, um, you know, I, you thought I stole something from you. And I said I was going to do an investigation about whether or not it happened. How much trust do you have that I'm going to come out telling you the truth? You already thought I think I stole something from you. It's very difficult for communities to trust that law enforcement can be, you know, held accountable by law enforcement, especially when you see what law enforcement is sometimes willing to do. I mean, last week, there was one officer that over a period of three years has falsified 400 charges. That's 400 people who paid a fine or might have been locked up based on one officer over three years. It's very hard to imagine and it's unreasonable to ask that communities should have to trust that other law enforcement are gonna be okay managing it. It doesn't mean that the folks doing the IA investigations are bad. It just means that the setup is a setup. Do they have in some departments across the country where they, they, they're starting to have a separate unit or sep that's not even affiliated with the police department investigating these incidents, aren't they? Yeah, so you're seeing a move for civilian investigations and separate sort of special prosecutors for when it's time to bring charges. Um, that, by the way, requires money. 
Um, so that's difficult. And it requires a kind of expertise that's not common in communities. I, part of the, the reason why folks just say, throw up their hands and say, forget it, is that in many of these cases, you need to know enough about law enforcement to do the investigation. And ain't nobody know enough about law enforcement unless you're Chris Maloney, right? Um, uh, you just don't know unless you've done the job. So it, it is actually technically quite difficult to set up. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing because when communities can't trust the folks they're supposed to call when they're in trouble, they don't call. And that means come, trouble comes calling for them. Someone asked, wouldn't it make more sense to use a taser instead of a gun? Yeah, so there are times when that can make more sense. Um, the taser is, in our uh, research, the second most deployed use of force tactic after hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, the firearm is, is relatively rare. Tasers kill too. It is supposed to be less lethal, but it is not non-lethal. Um, so yeah, that can work. The issue is if you're trying to neutralize somebody, um, if somebody's got a, a knife to someone else's throat, is a taser going to pre prevent that from going terribly? Um, it's not always the, uh, the reasonable response. And I don't know that tasers get us all the way out, uh, out of the way, but I'd rather be tasered than shot. And one more question before I let you go. Someone asked about police unions. How much of an obstacle have police unions that are, you know, uh, they've got a pretty firm grip on their membership, but are they really not serving police officers as well as they could by being resistant to reform and change? If in fact, that is the case. I don't know. Yeah, so you will see in many uh, municipalities that, uh, in fact, I rarely work with police chiefs um, who are fans of their own union, because when a chief wants to do something different, the union says, well, that's making our job harder. We don't want it. Um, and unions have massive power from a bargaining perspective. Most major city chiefs keep the job for about two and a half years. Union presidency can be around for decades. So yeah, they can be in the way, and they can get in, in, in the way of what the, the law enforcement officers want to have happen. We're seeing increasingly Black women, Latinx officers, um, black and, 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 and women officers, black and Latinx officers come out and say, the union doesn't represent me. They're not, they're not speaking for me. They don't have the same values I have. And also sometimes in the smaller communities where they really get together, the community is united and saying, this is what we want. You see something unprecedented. In Ithaca, where, where I'm talking about, they, they created a whole other department. I was fully expecting the union would sue to stop it. Governor Cuomo said, everybody's got to have a new plan. And this plan is radical. This plan is a, a complete departure from the way we've done public safety. Civilian led, majority unarmed. We don't send a badge and a gun to low level stuff where there's nonviolence. That's a, that's a recipe for getting rid of a lot of law enforcement. The Police Benevolent Association came out and endorsed the plan. And they did not, not that, that not because they thought, oh, this is going to be good for us. They did that because they said, our community will never be able to trust that what we're, what we're doing is legitimate ever again. So we can either lead or get dragged. And they chose to lead. Are you optimistic that um, these, these really harrowing incidents, the Derek Chauvin trial, that things that are happening, that, that, that things will change, or that, that uh, the country has will to serve police officers better and serve their communities better, which is really what it's about, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really that our politics is such a departure from the best that we have in our community. Do you remember all the stories, especially early on, um, the folks ringing bells when uh, healthcare workers were getting oh, off a shift? One of them. Right? Like, like I had a special little bell, a little cowbell, um, seven o'clock every time when, I, when we were living in, in New York. Um, uh, you, you remember the, the stories of folks coming and waving at windows for the folks that they knew were lonely and couldn't be with the people they loved. That's what our communities can be like. They didn't know those folks. That's strangers taking care of strangers. How much do we trust that the folks that we elect to lead us are built of the same character? But the folks in, in positions of, of power in this country are too often not as good as the best among us. And so I believe that we can do better because I also believe that optimism in the face of reality is a bit of a revolutionary act. So you try and be a bit of a revolutionary every day. But that's going to happen when we can have a politics that's as good as the best among us. And we have it for quite some time. And that's not just the last uh, uh, administration, the last four years. That's a, a larger problem. I think we can get there. And I think that way, because if I don't, then what's the use of trying? And I don't know how to give up. Right. I got, I got answers that, that, that went through way harder. Is there anything that people can do to 
to get involved with their communities to try to, you know, at least be a part of the conversation and potentially a part of the solution? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, uh, like, there's one thing I say to all the, the undergraduates who take my classes um, at Yale, I say, do anything. Um, but then one level deeper is the thing my dad has always said. My dad is a philosopher, so I will accept your condolences. Um, <laughs> and uh, so imagine that at the dinner table when you're five. Yeah. Um, but he would, he would say, um, you know, quoting William Jane. That's pretty well, it seems. So maybe you should give your dad some props. I give him some credit from time to time, but do not encourage his philosophical behavior, <laughs> Katie. Um, but he would say, if you want to be a philosopher, go where philosophers go. And the words are important because it's not just talk to a philosopher or read about it. Go and be next to the life of someone doing the kind of work that you think is important. Um, and I think that's true of not just philosophers, but anybody. You want to be someone who's making a difference in the community? Go figure out someone who you think is doing an okay job and go spend some time right next to them to see what it looks like to try and do something right. But there's so much good that needs doing. The first thing is do anything, anything at all. My friend, Brian Stevenson, who I'm proud to say he's, I mean, I don't know if he'd call me a friend, but I like, <laughs> uh, he's my friend. And he's, of course, for people listening, the head of the Equal Justice Initiative and wrote Just Mercy. And it's just an extraordinary human being. But he also, he always talks about pro being proximate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's sort of ironic to talk about this during, you know, on the heels of a pandemic. But, you know, we don't interact with people who are really we are and how important it is to I don't know share people's experience and circumstances and where they come from and I think that's really culture hey my friend Dana who I love she's also my hairdresser she has a question she texted me for you so Dana I'm trying to encourage her to go to law school uh Dr. Goff so maybe she'll do that but um she he, she says, police enforce the laws, states pass the law. Do laws have to change? Example, being pulled over for a broken tail light, and then it, you know, things, things get horrible. So I think Dana is saying, do we need to change laws on the state level? Yeah, and so, I mean, you get the uh, local statutes and state laws are really important for this whole process, but it's both and, right? So... If, if I were to say, hey, you, if jaywalking, which is, I think, technically illegal in New York, which would be a surprise to everyone who has ever lived in New York, right? <laughs> because everybody, like, I've never seen anyone not jaywalk. I've literally seen people wait to, for the light to change so they can cross against the red. Um, and what that means is that law enforcement's not enforcing that, right? Like, you go across a bridge in a rental car, what happens, and, and you don't have your, or you, don't, you don't pay the, uh, the toll, what happens is you get a ticket in the mail, there's nothing in the law that says you need to introduce a badge and a gun in order to enforce it. And that's part of the, the sort of reimagining, the creativity we need to have and saying, what, why am I introducing a gun to this situation? And also, we don't need to criminalize all the things that we've criminalized, right? Like we can decriminalize and just say, all right, so we're gonna call that a fine, we're gonna call that theft, we got laws that, that manage that. There's no reason to make it so that there's a chance you'll go to jail and be put into a cage for something so minor as, and I keep going back to Eric Garner, he bought a pack of cigarettes and then he sold them individually. Well, I really, again, thanks so much for taking the time to talk, talk with us. I feel like these conversations don't happen enough and are so important in this crazy world we live in. We get sort of bits and pieces and, uh, opinions without provenance so much, and it's really, or opinions without portfolio, I would say, and I think it's just really important to have these conversations. So I, I again, thank you so much for your time, and I'm actually going to publish that science article in my newsletter on Saturday. It's too late now to put to bed, but so people can read uh, about that study that shows diversifying police departments can have a really powerful, positive impact. No, please do. There's also a commentary of it that somebody, one of the two of us on this uh, call uh, wrote with it in science that I think might be useful for folks as well. So <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta thank you um, for having me on and for, for having this conversation and the long form, I think you're right, is really important. I gotta also, I gotta invite you to do one more thing. Not tonight, but in a couple of months, um, uh, after the anniversary on May 25th, um, uh, after people have looked away from this, 
please talk to folks. If it's not me, you know, there's lots of folks doing this kind of work. Talk to folks locally who are still in the, in the midst of this. You know, I talked to activists in, in Baton Rouge um, recently who have been working on this since, Al since Alton Sterling was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. Alton Sterling was shot and killed in 2016. They're still working on it. So I think it's really important that we have these conversations now when it's up and when there's a news peg to it. But it's even more important to make this part of how we talk about the process of making our democracy. So I just want to encourage you to continue using your platform to bring folks onto this when it's not making headlines elsewhere, because it's just as important then. I agree. And are there, you know, what I think, I've always found it very effective to talk to people who are modeling what's possible. So it can spark the imagination of other mm -hmm. people who are looking to reform, understanding that each you know, places differ and the community needs are different. But can you think of a police chief who has really been on the forefront of police reform who would be good for me to have a conversation with so we can hear what's possible? Yeah, you know, so I, I think he's probably quite busy right now. Um, there was just an investigation, uh, just announcement, DOJ is going to be investigating Minneapolis. But remember, the police chief in Minneapolis right? Chief Arredondo, he got up on the stand and testified against one of his officers. And what I, I hope that people understand in terms of his history, as a black man, he sued that police department for discrimination and won before he was a chief. That is, he's, he's lived an extraordinary life. I, I admire him. On the other hand, uh, you know, you can't help but wonder, how did a police officer who had how many complaints against him, Derek Chauvin, how did he continue to work with impunity, as far as I can tell, as a police officer in Minneapolis? So I appreciate that he testified, but what what was that? So, you know, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, would, I would ask you to have the conversation with Chuck Ramsey, who was police commissioner in Philadelphia, where after he fired six officers for excessive force and racial discrimination, civil service put him right back on. He had to ask the Department of Justice to come in and investigate and put them under a consent decree so that he could get rid of them. The story of Camden, the story of the department that was dissolved and then they built a new department. Scott Thompson, who was the chief there, he was trying to get rid of the bad officers forever. And there was the laws said that he couldn't get rid of them. So he said, I'm going to burn down the department to get rid of my bad officers. I'm not suggesting that Chief Rondo doesn't make mistakes or that he's the greatest chief ever, but I'm saying that that question is an important question for chiefs to have to answer in public. And if you're looking for names of other folks, I got a long list, but I do think this the story of, of Chief Arredondo is an important one because in the aftermath of that George Floyd public lynching, he was in the community every darn day talking to the folks who were, who were affected, doing the work of what a public servant, servant should, be, should be doing. So we can debate whether or not he should have been chief or he should have done different, something different with Derek uh, Chauvin earlier, but I think that's an important voice to have. And do you think that D the DOJ, the Department of Justice, should start to put pressure or investigate other police departments and that that sort of uh, inherent, I don't want to say threat, but the potential the potential of a, a federal investigation will really make de these departments look at themselves and change? Oh, it, it is a threat. I can tell you that no police chief wants to be investigated and then be put under a consent decree. It is, it feels costly. Um, your leadership's taken away. Lots of chiefs, like I said, they only got two and a half years. Now all, I, all I'm doing is working on the consent decree. They don't want it. So the threat is really important. Um, and uh, under the Obama administration, I will say there were landmark investigations. The Ferguson report was historic. We do not appreciate what Vanita Gupta did in writing that and saying, you know what, the way police collect fines and fees, that needs to be talked about. We need to go beyond just crime and looking at this. And still, they did 12 investigations and consent decrees in eight years. If you, if you multiply the special litigation division or unit by five times, they get maybe 20 a year done, maybe. 18,000 police departments. It's not going to save us, but it does provide an example. It provides possibly even scalable solutions. So it's everything in. Everything's got to be on the table, including those investigations. And, and I think you're, you're right to point out that the Obama administration had a whole commission studying policing in America. Did, you know, did, that, did that have any impact? And were any of the recommendations adopted by departments? 
it's funny. So you're seeing a lot of so of the 140 uh, pieces of legislation you, you let off talking about, almost all of them are off the shelf recommendations from the 21st century policing task force. That's the Obama task force. It's like we needed all uh, like Ferguson wasn't enough because the task force was after Ferguson. We needed George Floyd and this past summer for people to pick up the last set of recommendations. Some of, many of those recommendations are quite good. They're reasonable. They will make policing better. They're not enough. Right. So, I mean, in, in Minneapolis, you know, use of force was on the way down. It was a recent last year uh, was a spike was on the way down and consistently on the way down. Some like 50% over 20 some odd years, really great work. Do we feel like we want to model law enforcement after that? It was a model department for reforms, but I think no one would say, given what we've seen, that that's what we want law enforcement to look like, which means we need more than what we did the last time. And we need pretty significantly different in terms of strategy. That's why I keep talking about less, not just different. All right. Well, again, Dr. Philip Thoth, uh, and you teach at Yale. You went to, did you go to Harvard and, you t and now you teach at Yale or did dream that? No, I did my undergrad at Harvard. Then I did my grad school at Stanford. And now I'm a professor at Yale. That's how that worked. Uh, yeah, you're, you know, you're a real uh, slacker there, Dr. Goff. I am legitimately the least impressive person in my family, but we'll have that conversation next time. Wow. Wow. Well, I can't wait to hear about the rest of your family. Anyway, thanks again for this conversation. I hope that this was useful to people who uh, shared it um, I, or joined us. And uh, let's keep talking about this because I think it's critically important, obviously, and I really appreciate your expertise and time. No, thanks for real. Thank you for having the conversation. I really appreciate it. Okay. Take care, everybody. Good night. Bye, everybody.